Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of NAEP, I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar, sponsored by NJPA, entitled Addressing Chemicals of Concern on Campus. Furniture purchasing can lead to creating a healthier environment. Your presentation will begin momentarily, but before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items to help you maximize your experience. I'm sure many of you have used GoToWebinar, but if not, and this is your first time using the platform, let's take a brief moment to take a closer look at the control panel and discuss how you'll be participating today. On the left of your screen is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you'll be reviewing the presentation. To the right of your screen is the GoToWebinar control panel where you could select your preferred audio mode, participate in polls, and ask questions. You can use the orange arrow to open and close your control panel. Please note that the control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, you can click View on the menu and uncheck Auto Hide Control Panel. During the webinar, all phone lines will be muted so that everyone can hear the presentation without background distractions. We want this webinar to be interactive. We encourage you to share your thoughts with our speakers and submit your comments and questions. You can submit a question or a comment at any time during the presentation today by simply typing it into the question pane. Staff will be monitoring incoming comments and questions, and all questions will be addressed between presentations and at the end of the final presentation. Again, today's webinar is sponsored by NJPA and is being recorded. Before we begin the presentation, let me introduce you to our speakers. Today, our speakers, speakers include Judy Levine, who is the Pollution Prevention Director at the Center for Environmental Health, and she assists large purchasers, including higher education, government, healthcare organizations, and corporations on how to identify and prefer environmentally preferable products. Judy has generated more than 600 million in organizational purchasing power to prefer flame retardant free furniture. Today we also have Heather Henriksen, who is the director of Harvard University's Office for Sustainability. She has held her position for more than eight years and she started a career in higher education and spent more than nine years in the private sector in addition to nonprofit environmental policy work. She also holds a public administration, a master's in public administration focused on energy and environment from Harvard Kennedy School. I'll turn the presentation over to Judy. Thank you so much, Starlita, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Judy Levin, and I want to introduce you to the Center for Environmental Health, which is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the public from exposure to toxic chemicals. And one of the ways that CEH creates change is by partnering with organizations like yours, including higher education, government, healthcare, private corporations, to help organize your buying power to incentivize the production of environmentally preferable products. Just trying to advance the slide here. Sorry about that. There we go. So today we're going to talk about the chemicals and materials of concern that are present in furniture. We're going to delve into the change in the regulations and the opportunities that this can now afford your organization. Heather will share Harvard's case study and important lessons learned. And lastly, we'll talk about the tools and resources to help your organization identify safer products. And then we'll have our final question and answer period. So according to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 133 million people in the U.S., almost half of all Americans, are now living with chronic diseases and conditions. And although mortality is declining, leukemia, brain cancer, and other childhood cancers have increased by more than 20% since 1975. Nearly 1 in 12 Americans now suffer from asthma, and the risk of breast cancer has tripled over the last 40 years. As of 2008, nearly one in six children has a learning or developmental disability. So in spite of all the money we're spending on health care and in spite of the wonderful medical advances that, were, that are being made and keeping us from dying, we're actually sicker than we used to be. Of course, we can't know the exact cause of this increase, but there is research that, to, that, that suggests that some of the increased health concerns 
may be in part due to environmental exposures. So most people assume that if chemicals on the market, someone's checked to make sure that it's safe. But unfortunately, this is not the case. Of the roughly 82,000 chemicals registered for use in the US, 62,000 of them were grandfathered back in, in, in 1976, so no health data was ever received on these chemicals. Only 650 chemicals are monitored by the Environmental Protection Agency through their Toxic Release Inventory Program, and only 200 have been comprehensively tested for their safety to human health and the environment, and only five have actually been banned. So we have a broken chemical policy system but because of that, it means that the purchasing power of organizations like yours is the most important thing we can do to help the market move away from known chemicals of concern. So we're going to be focusing on a group of chemicals that have some problematic characteristics as a whole. And I'm wondering if I lost this slide. Ah, there we go back. Okay. So we're going to be focusing on five chemical classes. We're going to be talking about our materials. Flame retardants, PVC, volatile organic compounds, including formaldehyde, perfluorinated compounds used to stain resistance, um, and antimicrobials. And we're focusing on these because these are the known environmental and health hotspots in furniture. We're also focusing on them because we're tying into an, an, another initiative called the Healthier Hospitals Initiative that is focusing on these chemicals in healthcare. And what we find is when we harmonize our asks from many different sectors, like government and healthcare and higher education, and send a uniform message, then we can signal the industry with a really clear voice about what we want. And work has already begun on these chemicals of concerns in the institutional furniture sector, and we now have an opportunity to help them make that transition better. Um, we have actually heard from manufacturers, they actually want us and need us to express these preferences for products free of these chemicals and materials of concern so that they can justify spending the money to do the research and development. They don't want to invest in changes if their customers don't care or won't buy these products. And you'll notice that I've also listed other places that these chemicals of concerns are in other than furnishings. So you can just know that there are other areas for future uh, interest. Ah, there we go. So um, these five groupings of chemicals that we've just discussed typically have one or more of the following problematic characteristics. And rather than explain them for each chemical, I thought I would just do it here. So some of these chemicals are very persistent. And that just means they stay in the environment, and they don't break down into safer chemicals for long periods of time. And in some cases, like with the fluorinated compounds, they literally never break down. They will always be in the environment. And this is significant because as chemicals persist in the environment and in our bodies, the chance for these chemicals to have their adverse health effects on us increases. Some of these chemicals, such as the flame retardants and some of the other chemicals, are also bioaccumulative meaning they accumulate in plants and animals and then they become more concentrated as they move up the food chain. And who's at the top of the food chain? It's us as humans and especially nursing infants. And then also marine mammals are at the top of their food chain. So now we're going to delve, a and they're toxic, excuse me, which means they're harmful to human health and the environment. We're going to spend a little more time on the flame retardants and the other chemicals because of some recent changes to regulations and new opportunities that are now available. So flame retardants are chemicals that have been added to furniture with the intention of helping to stop fires from starting or to stop the spread of flames. But actually, research has shown they're actually not effective at reducing fires in typical office furniture and that a number of these have been associated with serious health effects. And we'll go into both of those issues. And you'll also see that flame retardants are used in a number of products, with actually electronics being the largest user, user of flame retardants, then building insulation, and then foam furniture, and lastly, wires and cabling. So how are we exposed? One thing that's important to understand that flame retardants are actually added into the foam, but they're not chemically bound into it, so they're constantly migrating out of the product. So they don't like off-gas over a short period of time and then stop releasing the chemical. Instead, they release the chemical over the lifetime of the product. So when we sit on these products, and even when we don't, these particles become airborne, they attach to dust, and they settle on the floor surfaces. So we actually have multiple points of exposure. 
and it's believed that the most significant route of exposure to flame retardants is actually from ingestion of contaminated dust particles. So when the flame retardants get on our hands, and then when we eat or touch our mouths, we're actually eating those chemicals. Um, we're also exposed through our diet, especially fatty foods like meat and dairy because flame retardants like fats. And then workers who come into contact with these flame retardants, those who make them, the chemicals, or incorporate them into products, or install them, or um, recycle them, are highly exposed. And then children have some unique routes because they are absorbed across the placenta. Um, unfortunately, breast milk is a transmission route, although it's still the best way to feed your baby. And because toddlers spend so much time on the floor, they have three to five times higher levels of certain flame retardants than their parents or their mothers. So there are hundreds of flame retardant chemicals on the market, and, and we certainly don't know the health effects of all. But we do know quite a bit about some of the most commonly used flame retardants, some of the PBDEs and the organohalogens, those that use um, either bromine or chlorine, which is a large part of the market. And this data suggests a wide range of health effects as seen on this chart. But it's concerning that as researchers are studying the chemicals that are designed to replace the known bad actors, that the replacements have also been found to have some of the serious health concerns. So for neurodevelopmental effects, I want to highlight um, the reduced IQ because that's important for universities and colleges, that the people coming into our institutions are ready for the learning challenges. And studies have shown that children who are born to moms with high levels of certain flame retardants, those PBDEs, have four to six fewer IQ points, which is actually similar to the effect that um, lead has on children's IQ. So some people are now calling flame retardants the new lead. Um, it can affect our endocrine system. There's a number of studies that show reproductive problems in both the um, legacy flame retardants as well as some of the new replacements. Increased time to pregnancy, decreased sperm quality. These are huge concerns. Additionally, flame retardants have been linked um, to cancer. There are three flame retardants that are on the list as known human carcinogens under Prop 65. And they're also been linked to suppressed immune systems and diabetes. So if flame retardants were found to increase fire safety in furniture, then you know, there would have to be a very serious analysis of the benefits of fire safety compared to toxic exposure. However, government studies, such as those done by the Consumer Product Safety Commission and NIST, have shown that flame retardants in furniture foam don't actually increase fire safety. They don't prevent the fires from occurring or decrease the severity of the fire. So while there's no evidence that the flame retardants actually increase fire safety, there are literally thousands of studies that show widespread environmental contamination and public uh, health exposure. So this slide refers to um, some flame retardants that shows that while the flame retardant may delay ignition a few seconds, the flame retardants eventually burn. And when they do, they produce increased amounts of soot, so double the amount of smoke, um, many times more of the carbon monoxide and far more of the soot. And the production of the increased soot and smoke can actually make escape more difficult and more hard to see for both the person in the fire and the firefighters to find them. And what's um, concerning is that it's the inhalation of these toxic gases that is actually the leading cause of fire deaths. It's not the actual fire itself. So the use of smoke detectors, fire sprinklers, the advent of fire safe cigarettes, those have all been more effective and healthier than adding large amounts of toxic flame retardants to our products. So in 2013, um, the National Fire Protection Agency did a study, and they found an average of 3,810 fires in dorms, fraternities, sororities, and barracks. I don't know why they got thrown in. And as you can see, the largest cause of fires was cooking equipment. 84% of the fires were caused from cooking equipment and 7% um, of fires were intentionally set. Furniture was not even listed as a source of ignition in the report because it just didn't reach a threshold. Uh, it's unclear whether there were any, in fact. Um, you will note that fires in these facilities nationwide did cause two deaths and 30 injuries, but the study does not say what the ignition source was for these deaths or whether the uh, whether these buildings were fully sprinklered. So while we don't know um, similar studies by NFPA that have been done in hospitals and also in office buildings, furniture was not listed as a cause of um, any fire deaths or injuries. So it's quite unlikely 
bad furniture fires were the cause of the, the two deaths that did occur. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to advance to the next slide here. Ah, there we go. Oops. Now we need to go back. So um, there's two current standards that address furniture flammability. And they're TB133, and then it has kind of a counterpart called ASTM E1537 and TB1172013. Um, the column, the standards under the green are considered large open flame um, standards, and they apply to seating furniture in public occupancies like hospitals, prisons, auditoriums, and in some case, storms. And um, these Standards are typically met with flame retardants in the foam, the fabric, and or the bearing materials. And they're used in very high quantities, sometimes up to 5% of the weight of the foam. Furniture that meets TB133 uh, is typically much more expensive. Manufacturers have said it's about 20 to 30% more expensive. Um, they use added materials, there's added labor, and there are very expensive burn tests that have to be done. Um, choosing 133 furniture can lead to more limited design and fabric choices. But we have some options now because in uh, January of 2014, a new standard got implemented called Technical Bulletin 117-2013, and it became mandatory in January 2015. And this standard applies to non-public buildings or, and this is where the or is very important, or public occupancy buildings that are fully equipped with an automatic sprinkler system, one that meets the NFPA code for sprinkler system. So TB117 um, is now a smolder test, and that addresses the major cause of furniture fire deaths, which are smoldering cigarettes. Um, it uses a realistic fire testing scenario by testing the fabric in conjunction with the foam, like a real piece of furniture. And another benefit of the new standard is flame returns are not needed to meet the standard. Many fabrics are naturally smolder resistant, and they can pass this test without the use of flame retardants. And for those that um, cannot pass, which are typically more the cottons and the linens, the natural fibers, a lightweight polyester batting can be used under the fabric to protect the foam. So this standard is less expensive, and manufacturers report it has a more comfortable fit and will last longer because they say flame retardants actually make the foam hard and make it degrade more quickly and you will also have more design and fabric choices. Lastly, I want to bring your attention to the label on the right. So while TB117-2013 can be met without the use of flame retardants, there's actually nothing in the standard that prohibits their use. And having very worked very hard along with many people to change the standard, we were frustrated that even with the change in regulation, people would not know if the product did or didn't contain flame retardants. So we co successfully co-sponsored a bill to require the labeling of furniture sold into the state of California as to whether it did or did not contain flame retardants. And many of the major manufacturers have adopted its use nationally. So when talking with vendors, be sure to specify furniture products that meet TB117-2013 without the use of flame retardants and ask them to be clearly labeled as such. This clear labeling can be very helpful in the future as you inventory your products to determine which products you want to retain or replace. One consideration to know is that um, if you have furniture that migrates from a fully sprinklered building to an unsprinklered building, you would have to be mindful of those kinds of moves because you wouldn't want to move a piece of furniture um, into an unsprinklered building. That's 117-2013. And there are ways to work with that, and we can talk about that for anybody who's interested. So I just want to dive a little bit into Technical Bulletin 133. So as I mentioned, um, these are some of the occupancies that are maybe considered special, but it varies from state to state. And so it's going to be very important for you to ask your state and local fire marshal what types of buildings are considered public buildings in your jurisdiction and what flammability standards you can meet. Our research has not found any state requirements for flame retardants in fully sprinklered buildings. Um, but you should check with the local fire marshal and within your organization, too, to make sure that there are no references to these open flame standards, TB133 or the ASDM standard. Um, I have to say we have not uncovered any jurisdiction that requires TB133 in any office building. Local fire marshals can require compliance to a standard, even if the state does not. But if you were to uh, come up with this, these types of decisions can be questioned. 
So now we're going to move into some of the other chemicals of concern. So volatile organic compounds um, are include a variety of chemicals, in, com, including formaldehyde. These are important because they affect indoor air quality. And unfortunately, we spend 90% of our time in indoors, so our air quality is extremely important. And these VOCs are emitted by a wide variety of products. And while they tend to evaporate from products over time, um, humans do breathe them in, and they can be emitted at high levels and then initially taper off. But some VOC emissions are actually emitted more slowly from solid materials. So formaldehyde is used in pressed wood products like particle board or plywood and fiberboard. It's also used in glues and adhesives. And even some textiles like permanent pressed fabrics can have a formaldehyde treatment. Um, we're exposed to it primarily by inhaling the formaldehyde gas or vapor. Uh, formaldehyde, as you'll see, is, um, has some health concerns. It's a respiratory toxicant. It's an asthma trigger. And the most common effect um, is irritation of the ears, nose, and throat. But it's also a known human carcinogen. And it's linked to nose and sinus cancers, as well as some types of leukemia and lymphoma. Um, it also has been linked to um, decreased fertility and also the risk for spontaneous miscarriage in humans. So our recommendation and the recommendation of the Healthier Hospitals Initiative is to prefer those products or to specify those products that meet California Section 01350. This is very well known in the industry. And there are eco-labels um, like SCS Indoor Advantage Gold or Green Guard Gold that replicate this. So that's important to specify. And if you have wood being used, that's composite wood, those products should meet the formaldehyde emissions under the um, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, Title 17. Again, although it's a California regulation, it's pretty much the industry standard. Another chemical concern that you'll need or you'll want to avoid is the use of polyvinyl chloride or PVC. PVC and other chlorinated problems have a number of environmental health um, problems actually throughout its life, life cycle from the manufacturing process where they use carcinogens to the use phase where additives like lead and other heavy metals or phthalates are added to make the product more flexible or versatile. Or also in the use phase, flame retardants are added to the vinyl fabric sometimes, and these additives can leach out of the PVC. And then at end of life, there's actually no safe way to dispose of it. It's difficult to recycle, and if it burns, it produces combustion byproducts that are toxic the, um, dioxins, which are potent carcinogens. So our recommendation is you avoid products with PVC. There are lots of um, PVC-free options for fabric and other components. Obviously, very, very small parts um, will not be a big concern. The next group of chemicals that we're going to talk about are the fluorinated compounds. So these are things that are used for stain resistance or oil and water resistance, and they're often found in fabrics, but they're also found in lots of other products. You may be familiar with them in our cookware, in clothing, and carpeting. One of the concerns about these compounds is that the carbon-fluorine bond that makes them is extremely strong. It really does not break down. And that was hard for me to wrap my head around, that these chemicals will be found from here to eternity. Um, and these chemicals are found widely in humans, including in developing fetuses. They're found in wildlife and in environment all over the globe. This is not a chemical found in nature. So if it's found, somebody put it there. Um, they are transported via air and water currents. The releases here can be significant for communities on the other side of the world. Um, they also migrate out of product and find their way into our bodies. Um, some of them are bioaccumulative, and again, we're at the top of that food chain. And you'll see some of the health effects um, that are associated with them. Some of the more known problematic um, fluorinated compounds, the C8s, have been, or the perfluorinated uh, PFOS, they call them, have been banned or voluntarily restricted. But what we're finding is that their replacements have many of the same problematic characteristics, especially the problem with persistence. So our recommendation is to avoid these treatments. Um, it should not be difficult to do so. There are fabrics that come without that. Oftentimes, you have to specify that, even that you want them. So it's easy to avoid, and that's our recommendation. And then we're going to focus on, I think, our last chemical of concern, which are the antimicrobials. And Dr. Ted Shetler, who is a Harvard School of Public Health graduate, as well as an MD, um, just put out a report yesterday about antimicrobials and whether they help reduce um, associated infections in healthcare. 
and uh, his research indicated that there is very limited evidence that antimicrobials added to furnishings reduce the spread of infections. Um, limited meaning virtually none, actually. There's some evidence that copper alloys may have some help, but they're not necessary in um, a non-hospital environment for sure. Um, we're exposed through ingestion. These chemicals um, do come out through inhalation and dermally, and then you can see they're associated with a number of health issues. And what's also of great concern is that they can create these superbugs. These are uh, bugs that are resistant to treatment, and this is a huge public health issue. So we want to avoid them, and again, um, you just need to specify that, and that should be uh, doable, but you need to specify it. Okay, Oops. sorry about that. So now the good part. Um, there's lots of resources available to help you, and in fact, I want to mention that the Center for Environmental Health has received funding um, through the John Merck Foundation to help organizations achieve these goals, and so we stand ready to assist you and answer questions you may have and provide you with documents you'll need. So we have fact sheets. Um, we can do webinars for your organization if that would be helpful. We have letters you can send to your suppliers letting them know that this is your preference. Um, we have RFP, and uh, we have language technical specifications you can use in your RFPs or your RFIs currently that specify no flame retardants, and we're currently working uh, with Healthcare Without Harm on developing these for the other chemicals of concerns as well. And there are lists of products that are available. Um, we have a list of flame retardant free products, and there's also a list through Healthier Hospitals, through Healthcare Without Harm, that lists products without the other chemicals of concern as well. And we also have a purchaser pledge, which I'll just briefly touch on in a moment. So just for your eye visual, here's a, a picture of some of the manufacturers where um, they have flame retardant free furniture. I bet if you look at this list, you'll find many, many of the vendors you work with. Um, the ones that are highlighted in green are not only flame retardant free, but they're also free of the other chemicals of concern that we've discussed, or at least some of their products are. Again, you need to specify that to make sure that's what you receive, but there's plenty of options. So now I want to highlight the CEH Purchaser Pledge. Um, I'm so proud to announce that Harvard was the first university to sign on to this pledge. Um, and you can see there are many, many other organizations, Facebook, Yahoo, Kaiser Permanente, the City of Portland, Multnomah County, Genentech, et cetera, Perkins and & Wills and HDR Architecture, who said, we want to prefer these products. We want to put our purchasing power to move the market more rapidly towards slime retreat flame retardant free products. And this purchaser pledge will now be expanded to include the other chemicals of concern. So that big spot in the middle where it says your logo here, we hope that you'll go back to your organization and you'll be the second university to sign on to the purchaser pledge. I also want to give you a little bit of hints about some existing eco labels and standards for furniture. Um, these are helpful, but none of them address all of the chemicals of concern that we've discussed. So you'll see some multi-attribute um, eco-labels like BISMA. They have a self-certified model called E3 and then a third-party certified level two um, address some of these issues, but not all. And Cradle to Cradle and Declare and HPD are disclosures, which I know Heather's going to talk about. And those are really important tools. Um, there are some single-attribute eco-labels that are helpful. We discussed already the air emissions ones. And um, FSC is a sustainably sourced wood that you can specify for your wood product. And then Cradle to Cradle and SCS Recycle Contact, Content excuse me, are single attributes for textiles. So um, that's what I wanted to share. Again, I wanted to share with you the resources that the Center for Environmental Health has provided. And again, to offer our assistance because we're excited to work with you. So thank you so much. And I will turn it over to Heather Hendrickson. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Um, so I'm just going to quickly take you through our case study. I'm going to give you a bit of context before I jump in. The first slide here is just that we have a university-wide sustainability vision and plan. Well-being is at the heart of our sustainable development-driven science-based uh, vision. And health and well-being and, and climate are our two areas of focus. 
I also just show this of our goals and our plan. We have four goals, eight standards and 33 commitments to do by 2020. All of our eight standards touch health and wellness, and we think that that is important. But why do we really, why are we listening to this and, and why do we all, um, why does this matter? And what are we here to talk about today? And I think that, you know, Judy telling you the science and the public health impacts and risks is certainly the reason to care. And then also safeguarding the, our own students as well as our community members. I think the students expect it and I think increasingly parents are going to be vocal and, and expect this as well. Um, and I think we all care about it personally. Oops. Yeah, this is just to highlight, you, you can check it, there'll be links at the end to our sustainability plan, but this is just one of the ways in um, signing this chemical flame retardant free furniture pledge that we actually have been acting on research from our researchers um, and then that we're also working with them to advance additional opportunities on campus and I'd be happy to speak to any of these. Um, later. I also do want to call to attention that flame retardant free furniture is one thing, but we're also actively working with the um, Harvard Chan School of Public Health um, uh, and Silent Spring on a healthy green campus initiative in the URLs in there. So with our increased focus on healthy materials, we're really trying to look at this very holistically. Um, and I think um, two things I'll just point out. Of our eight standards, one of them are green building standards. We require in their health product disclosures and um, lead version four for our, for our projects. And lead version four for our major um, construction renovation projects. And then for all of our projects, even the small ones, we were, we're requiring HPDs. So we're really trying to drive transparency and understand what is going into our buildings. Um, and then we also have our major projects evaluate the living building challenge, including the healthy materials pedal. So, you know, why are we here today and, and the, the focus? I'd say three things. One is we decided to use this flame retardant free pledge case study as an opportunity for us to say, how do we try to get rid of a bad class of chemicals um, in our furniture in a, you know, across the university? And so this is sort of one was a, our, foundational test, if you will, to try to do this in other um, products in other ways. We are also beyond um, having learned from the flame retardant free furniture focus, we are also going to be working and looking at antimicrobials, highly fluorinated chemicals or those sort of stain repellent, repellents, as well as um, we think an easy one is mercury free lighting. And as I said, I think this really um, looking at our HPD data, reviewing materials in our buildings is a great faculty living lab research project that we will continue to build on. So why make the switch? I think um, if, if Judy didn't convince you, um, I'll, I'll see if I can help. But I, I think, you know, first and foremost, it is about reducing toxins in the environment and really reducing your own body burden of toxins and being concerned about our community, our people. Uh, I do think it is an opportunity to, to save costs, as Julie men Judy mentioned, in the furniture. Um, I think it also very much aligns with our mission and values related to higher ed. This is about translating research and teaching into action. Our researchers are telling us that these chemicals of concern cause real health impacts for people, and we should be demonstrating how we address it. Uh, I think it's a success story for all of us to be involved in, in a, crucial element of um, sustainability and sus any sustainable um, sustainability definition. And I think that we have huge purchasing power um, individually and collectively in higher ed. And I think um, as has been proven in the past, um, we can move um, markets much more quickly than, than regulations. So on to our, our flame retardant free pledge and the steps that we sort of took in order to be able to sign it, I would say they're sort of in, in five or four rather major areas. So one is we started by collaborating with Judy and her team and other scientists and our own researchers at our um, Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School to really understand the opportunity as well as the science. Um, secondly, and I think that is important, um, especially in 
are educated communities where people want to know why we're proposing something. Secondly is educating our community. So we educated folks about the risks and opportunities, in particular on the flame return free furniture around this regulatory change so that we then have the opportunity to do something. Um, Massachusetts signed on to um, California's change in, in accepted TB 117 2013, except for Boston. We'll talk about that later, um, although there's a good story. Third is we really leveraged our institutional partners, so in particular strategic procurement and environmental health and safety, to just understand, um, in particular procurement, we have 28 preferred furniture vendors. Who offers what? Um, and we really started there so that we could then um, educate our community about the options because there were many. And then fourth, um, I'd say, you know, we gained multi-stakeholder um, buy-in and, and feedback and engagement. So the, the four groups that we really focused on are one, students who are hugely interested in this and doing things on this. Um, secondly, our facilities and operations leaders who make many of these decisions or hire the teams that do. And then also our project management groups that again run many of our projects and buy lots of furniture, particularly around renovations and new construction. And then we also engaged our senior leaders so they understood the risks of not doing this and the opportunities to do it and the fact that this was really revenue neutral, um, but just needed to have a little bit of passion and commitment um, from all involved to, to make sure it could happen. So as you noted, or I've, I've sort of mentioned, these are um, including CEH um, groups that we have worked with and continue to work with on ongoing education and projects. And I would just take a moment here to say all of these groups had a major role in changing California's policy and also um, I'm happy to report that Boston has actually changed their fire code to map to all of Massachusetts and California. So Boston now will be accepting, um, accepting TB 117 2013 um, in, in the code. Again, as Judy elaborated in sort of sprinkler buildings and you have to check the code, but essentially they will be um, allowing this. So that's a huge step forward. And I would say that our office played a role in that not in driving regulation, certainly, but we, by understanding from CEH and Green Science Policy and Silent Spring, what was happening on the regulation, we were able to educate our facilities and operations leaders who had schools in Boston, business school, medical school, and, on, 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 and others, um, and that we were able to go to our researchers and say, would you, would you like to write research, uh, or rather um, letters of support to have the regulation changed? So we played a role of just educating our population um, and allowing them to advocate if they wanted on behalf of the changes. And the other thing I know that we did is we um, enabled many very large purchases of furniture to hold off knowing um, that this change was imminent. So that's another great thing I think that our sustainability office played a role of. I mentioned our institutional partners. Um, the other thing I would just say is, so we signed the pledge, we educated people enough to sign the pledge. Um, the other piece I would just say in actually implementing this of who do we engage and how do we do it. So one, we, we got buy-in from our largest clients because Harvard schools run independently of each other. So we got all the schools aligned. We got the projects, um, major projects that were buying furniture aligned. And then we also used a, a governance group that our office runs to pull all these folks together and really get them understand why we wanted to do this and get them to buy in. And then once we did that and the facilities and operations leaders really were bought in and understood that this would be we would do the heavy lift and tell them how to do this and um, guide them. They then were comfortable because um, they understood the science and wanted to do it to, to do this. Um, and then we got all the schools and our executive vice president to sign off on Harvard going this direction of no longer purchasing furniture with slime retardants in it, um, except where there was a very small regulatory obligation. And then lastly, and I think this is a huge, or, or I have two more points. Um, first is hugely important, I think, as we all 
encounter is when you get down to brass tacks and the practical of a project person or someone who procures furniture, this has to be easy for them. So we created our office with toolkit and buyer's guide to give them everything that they needed to hand a code consultant or to hand a design architect or purchaser, including specs. Um, to make it easy for them, to ensure that it was successful at the implementation level. And really we used that guide um, and toolkit to really address some of the key questions that had come up from our purchasers and answer those questions all in one place. And that is a publicly available guide that is on our website um, that we would be delighted if people um, you know, wanted to look at and use. And then the fifth thing that I didn't write on the slide, but I think is we are still working and is ongoing to train design architects and people that we work with, third parties that work with our school, um, to who also in projects scope and spec furniture buy it. And um, so again, we are working um, with those folks to make sure that they are specking furniture this way and that they understand why and how to do this. And we're um, continuing to answer sort of ongoing community questions and will continue to do trainings um, as needed. So I think the last um, slide here is potential next steps for you to consider um, and how, you know, based on what we've done and based on um, what CEH has done with others successfully, I think this is a, a laundry list of things that you could sort of try to think about, um, obviously, based on your audience, but things that you could get you from the beginning to actually signing this pledge and, more importantly, implementing um, policies so that you are not buying furniture in the future with, with chemical flame returns in it. And I really would highlight something that I added, which is specify your preference for products with reduced toxins in all projects and contracts. Uh, I think that that's key. They've got to get in at the very beginning, um, and they've got to be something that projects and furniture purchasers and strategic procurement is held accountable for. Um, and then lastly, here's our contact info, our website of our whole plan, our health and wellness um, page that has chemicals of concern within it. That's where our toolkit let, um, rests, which is something that we created with Judy um, and our researchers at the School of Public Health and Medical School. And then also our sustainability impact, which tells everyone um, how we're doing on our goals and objectives. So with that, I am delighted to take questions. Thank you. Judy. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Judy. Um, we have had uh, some comments and um, a question to come in, and I'll direct this one to uh, Judy. Uh, Judy, if you will, um, we talked about the public health impacts and the risks associated with flame retardants. How does that relate to the uh, living building challenges red list? Does that, does that uh, challenge address some of the issues you brought up? I actually uh, have to admit I am not familiar with the living, I, I know it exists, the Living Building <laughs> Challenge Red List. I have not looked at it. Um, one of the things that is true about flame retardants, though, <clears throat> is that they've been very creative in uh, finding chemical cousins. So as soon as something goes on a red list, for example, when DECA-BDE, uh, deca I'm only saying the long name because there's a meaning, deca diphenyl ether was found to be problematic. The chemical industry changed it with decabromodiphenyl ethane. So they just changed the bond a little bit. They had the same persistence problems, the same toxicity problems. So in the case of furniture and flame retardants, you just don't need them. So it's not a matter of finding a safer alternative. They're just not needed. Furniture is just not the cause of fires um, in these settings. And so uh, I'm not sure about the Living Building Challenge. I'll take a look at the Red List, but if there's something more specific, I'm happy to look more into that. Thank you, Judy. Um, one additional comment that we did have come in is that an ignition source can be responsible for igniting any combustible, um, such as furniture. So that was one of the comments that came in as you were speaking earlier about some of the areas. So I didn't know if you wanted to expand upon that just one more time. Um, so yes, there's issues about what's first ignited versus what's second ignited. 
and furniture is just not an item that has been found to be the first source of ignition. So typically, um, it's something else. And then furniture, I suppose, can get involved as it being a second source. But by the time something else is on fire and igniting a piece of furniture, no amount of flame retardant in that product would probably stop that fire because it's a big, big flame at that point. So I, I don't know if that's where the person's getting at it, at getting at this from. But again, furniture um, has not been reported to be a major source of fires in any of the settings that NFPA has looked at. Thank you. Um, we have had some more questions to come in. And again, uh, Judy, this one is also for you. Uh, is there any hope in changing TB117 2013 to be allowed in non sprinklered buildings? That's a really good question. Um, there's actually a lot of attention right now on this issue. TB133 is um, a very small amount of furniture. Somebody, uh, one of the manufacturers told me it was about 2% of the furniture made. And of that 2%, uh, half of it was going to Boston. So now that Boston has changed its code to allow for 117-2013 in, in, in fully sprinklered buildings, the amount of um, TB133 furniture is going to go way, way down. And manufacturers are going to become even almost you know, reluctant to make it because it's such a small product. Um, so there is, the furniture industry is definitely advocating for changing 133 so that fully, uh, either sprinkler or unsprinkler buildings can comply with 117-2013. But we're not there yet, but there's definitely effort in that area. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, free furniture across the board. Uh, what suggestions would either of you have for what the most impactful steps would should focus on? Take, excuse me. <clears throat> free furniture across the board. What suggestions do you have for the most impactful steps? And where should we focus on? Where's the lowest hanging fruit? Heather, do you want to start with that? Sure, so the lowest hanging fruit with existing furniture, is that what you're saying, or? Furniture across the board is what they're asking. Well, I, yeah, so I think the, the first place to start is just don't buy any new furniture with flame retardants in it. Um, you know, that the regulation has changed and it's not needed, um, and you can very safely meet the flammability standards without it. Um, so I would start there. That's where we started. And then I think there is a larger question of what do you do with all the existing stuff? And I know that, um, you know, different groups, I know in particular um, Green Science Policy Institute is working on a national level to sort of address the handling of all this furniture that we now have um, with these things in them. Yeah, I would agree with Heather. Um, definitely going slow return and free is, is low-hanging fruit, cost neutral or even cost savings better for health and the environment, uh, plenty of choices available. Um, I would say that one of the things just to mention is definitely to ask for your furniture to be labeled in the, the way we discussed. Um, even though it's a California requirement, as many manufacturers are labeling it. But this is important to assure that you're getting what you ask for. Some manufacturers, believe it or not, are actually defensively labeling their products that they do contain new flame retardants, even though they're telling customers they don't because they're concerned about liability. If somebody found flame retardants in their products, they don't want to be liable. That's not the intention of this label. And so um, by specifying that you want furniture free of flame retardants that are labeled as such, you can really help move the market towards clear labeling. And that in turn helps you as, as you, know, you decide what you're keeping and what you're not keeping. Um, I think the fluorinated chemicals and the antimicrobials are um, also fairly easily handled because if you don't specify them, typically um, you can get them without. And the indoor air quality has become very much uh, a major issue. And I would say you'll find uh, many, many products, well over half of the market that can meet those indoor air qualities. And that's a great place to start improving indoor air. I, I would just also add that you know, higher ed, um, this may be newer for higher ed, but there are many companies, and in particular hospitals, like Judy mentioned, who are already buying furniture and specifying furniture without flame returns, as well as antimicrobials and stain repellents that are harmful. 
right. Yeah, and um, one of the things we talked about in a, a previous meeting was if for any reason you can't just tackle this as a whole, it would be interesting to look at your furniture spend and see where you're buying, what you're buying the most of. And you can also consider starting with that product category. So if task seating is your biggest spend, um, you know, you can pilot this with that if you can't take on furniture, you know, upholstered furniture as a whole. Great, and we have had a few more questions that I really would like to fit in. Um, I will direct this one to Heather. Um, Heather, are there flame retardants problems in mattresses? Uh, that is a very excellent question. And in our research, um, there can be harmful substances that are in mattresses, um, in, and including flame retardants. But it is, again, something that you may need to make sure you're, you specify and you're working closely with your vendors to make sure that there aren't harmful chemicals in your mattresses. And Judy may also want to take this. Yeah, I would say um, the research is not as complete as we would like it to be. And there's some um, inquiries going on with manufacturers to understand what's in their product. And I would say the mattress industry seems to be a little bit high behind the furniture industry in understanding what is in their products. So as Heather said, it's very important to specify what uh, chemicals of concern you don't want in there. And it is possible to meet the standard without the use of uh, flame retardants by using a barrier of fabric that doesn't have to contain flame retardants. So just asking um, is very important. And we do have questions that you can ask your vendor, and Heather may as well, to help find out. So happy to help with that if needed. Great. And I would just say that the number one thing everyone can do is, is transparency. Everyone can be asking these questions at a minimum of what's in the products that you are purchasing. And then I think secondly, obviously you can specify them without. Um, this question, Judy, um, a participant would like to go back to the sprinklers and buildings and would like to know that if someone had a non-sprinkler building, what suggestions do you have for actions that they can take now? Okay, that's a great question. Right, so if you're in an unsprinkler building and you're kind of stuck perhaps with TB 133, and actually it's interesting, in some states, some states make no references to public buildings in TB 133. So you may be in a state that doesn't even require it, even if you are in an unsprinklered building. Um, again, check with your local and state farm marshal on that. But um, there are some choices you have. So there are two distinguishing factors when you're stuck with TB133. One is what kind of flame retardant chemical is being used. Um, the organohalogens, those that I mentioned, the halogenated flame retardants, those containing bromine and chlorine are the most well studied. And I would say avoid their use. Their replacement is organophosphorus generally, which we know less about. So, you know, they appear to be somewhat better in some ways, but, but you know, neither ideal. And the, maybe even a more important thing is to ask your vendors, where are those flame retardants placed? They can be in the foam, they can be in the fabric and or the barrier material. Um, some of the manufacturers put them in everything. Some of them only have it in the barrier. I would choose the product that use flame retardants in the fewest components and hopefully just the barrier material. Uh, Heather, I have one question for you. Um, have, have the changes that you've made enabled Harvard to save money on furniture procurement? The changes we've made definitely between purchasing TV 133 and 117-2013 have absolutely saved us money. Um, you know, we will endeavor, we're endeavoring to sort of quantify that, but I, I know that to be certain. Um, I would just use as an example, Partners Health, um, who buys a lot of furniture here in Boston, said that actually under the regulation where they did track their furniture procurement, um, that it cost them an extra $50 million. So the numbers are not insignificant, um, and there is a, a cost premium. So we do know that we have saved money. There's been no upcharge. Um, if not, there's been savings. So I would definitely say there is, that's a strong argument to make. Yeah, I, I agree. And with every, um, even with chairs, the cost variation, manufacturers told us 20 to 30% more to do um, TB133, but we've seen price variances as low as $15 up to $100 per chair difference. 
and in a sofa, it can be two to five hundred dollars difference. So those add up when you're buying large amounts, and yeah, it's easy to make a big, significant cost savings. Great. Um, final question here. Um, I know we've talked a lot about furniture, but this particular individual would like for you both to weigh in on hand sanitizers, if you will. Go ahead, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I am not a chemist, so I will do my best on this one. Um, so triclosan and triclocarban are antimicrobials that are often used in hand soaps and um, other personal care products. They're known to have some of the health effects that we discussed, like testicular cancer and um, other health concerns. I'll have to look at my own notes. And uh, so those are to be avoided. Uh, Kaiser Permanente a large hospital system said we are not going to use anything with triclosan that hand washing just with soap and water is just as effective as these antimicrobials and in fact just to know Kaiser um, actually banned the use of 15 different antimicrobials in any of their building products including furniture because um, they understood they were not really producing the uh, benefits purported to be and we were increasing the toxic load so um, I unfortunately am not an expert on personal care products I wish I was but I do know that um, it's it can be avoided and I think in fact Harvard uh, was working on that um, before yeah, Colin so we're, had a horrible we're, bike accident yeah we're, we're actually working on it right now and I would just say that, um, and it's a, the challenge for us is we have a diffuse, we have a number of vendors who provide cleaning services and provide products. The ones that we know, they're in-house, um, our group purchases, we know, which is a majority of the campus, does not, they do not use antimicrobials in any cleaning solutions or including hand sanitizers that are around campus. So we're working right now, we've actually just helped um, some of our gyms ensure that their soaps that they're offering um, and that are in their facilities do not have antimicrobials. So we are working to to be like Kaiser and say, yes, no antimicrobials, but certainly um, since the majority of our campus we know is without it, it is able, you're able to get hand sanitizers as well as soaps that do not have antimicrobials and that are very safe and effective at hand washing and keeping you safe. And I just want to add one of um, the things that I know many organizations, including Harvard, are doing as are preferring products that are certified through Green Seal, and those have environmentally preferable characteristics. So that would be a good starting point. Yeah, again, our, our internal group is uh, all the cleaning products are 100% Green Seal certified. Well, before we close today's webinar, I'd like to thank our sponsor and our speakers, both Judy and Heather, for providing such terrific insight on today's topic. I want to remind you all that NAEP will be sending out an electronic survey asking for your feedback. And for those of you who have had more than one person joining you today, please be sure to include their information in your survey response so that we can also provide them with a copy of today's PowerPoint slides and also a edited recording um, of today's recording. NAEP continues to offer professional development opportunities and we'd like to thank you all for participating. In the final minute, Judy or Heather, do you have any closing remarks? <laughs> no, other than we're delighted to help others who um, are interested in this and please give us feedback about what's on our website. Thank yeah, you so and much. This is Judy. We're uh, happy to assist and are looking for the second university to become the second pledge <laughs> signer. So please contact me. Well, thank you both and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.